Hello, this is Mr. Stromberg. Welcome back to more art history. Got two uh, crazy talented painters today. We're still talking about the, the Baroque period. So this is um, roughly the 1600s. Uh, and we're going to um, go to other countries today besides Italy for the first time. We've been talking about the Italian Renaissance and uh, the Italian Baroque last week in talking about uh, Bernini and Caravaggio. And if you remember, the idea of the Baroque is to take uh, art and basically just crank it up in terms of its complexity, uh, its assault on your senses. Um, Bernini, if you'll remember, made crazy high action sculpture that looks more like frozen white, black and white photography. Um, and then we have uh, Caravaggio, who's uh, using dark and light in fascinating ways. So today we're going to talk about two artists who um, borrow a lot from Caravaggio uh, and his followers and uh, advance painting forward in big ways in Baroque times. We're talking about Rembrandt. So there's Rembrandt on the left. Okay, so Rembrandt, self-portrait is the name of that picture. And then the one on the right there is Velasquez. Velasquez, uh, the water carrier is the name of that piece. Velasquez, the water carrier. So let's get going. Uh, just to think back on a uh, little bit of context for today. Uh, this is the change between the Renaissance and the uh, Baroque period. So you can see a painting by Raphael there from uh, uh, earlier part of the 1500s. And then we see a painting around 1600 from Caravaggio there on the right, okay, the calling of St. Matthew. And you can see how in the Raphael painting, everything is brightly lit, brightly colored, um, shadows very controlled, but also uh, it, it just has an extremely different look. Even the darker areas are somewhat illuminated. And then you get to Caravaggio and everything is dingy and dark. And um, he uses light in order to, um, just like uh, in the theater, you would highlight people on a stage with a spotlight. He uses light in order to direct the viewer's eye and create incredibly dynamic, uh, kind of in your face, brutal painting. And if you remember, um, Caravaggio has a, a crazy biography to uh, go along with it, right? One of violence and uh, excess as well. And somehow that comes across in the brutality of just how stark the contrast and the dark and light is in those pictures. So there's another renaissance going on as well. And so to jump back again, at the same time as uh, Michelangelo and uh, Raphael, um, there was a, a, a super famous artist uh, from Germany. His name was Albrecht Dürer, okay, D-U-R-E-R. -E and here he is, Albrecht Dürer, in a self-portrait that he's uh, created here. And um, that's important. We're not going to have time to go into depth about the Northern Renaissance, but you shouldn't think that it was only happening in Italy. Of course, those events spread out from Florence, um, where they initially ignited, to places like Rome, okay, uh, and then also uh, to the north, because travelers were coming and going all the time from Rome. It was the center of Roman Catholicism. And so Durer was someone who came to Italy, saw all these amazing uh, things that were going on, and brought them back to Germany. And if you look at the paintings from Germany, they have a decidedly different look to them. Italy is a hot Mediterranean climate, and colors are very bright. Germany is a pretty uh, you know, gray, rainy place a lot of the year. Much colder, obviously, being further north. And so there's a different sensibility, a different feeling towards art. Of course, the Reformation happens at the same time with Martin Luther as well. And um, so all of it's kind of complicated by that. Durer, probably most well known for creating these elaborate woodcuts, which went into uh, books, uh, printed books of the Bible. Here you see um, uh, a piece called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, where he's taken passages from the book of Revelation and just with um, mind-numbing amounts of detail carved these wood plates. And the printing press is also invented at this time. And so right now we're circulating books for the first time, which means that uh, um, you don't have to be wealthy uh, in order to have books, in order to read now. Uh, anybody can learn how to read. And this has huge consequences in terms of circulating the Bible and uh, um, circulating pamphlets on ideas. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a key part of the Reformation with Martin Luther, but also um, revolutionizes uh, the world pretty much at the time, the printing press. So all that to say, ideas from the Renaissance eventually make their way to the north, to Germany, and to other uh, places north. And that's important because we're going to talk about Rembrandt first. So Rembrandt, uh, Rembrandt von Rhein is his name. He is from Amsterdam, okay, uh, lives roughly 1600 to... 
1670. And uh, both our artists pretty much lived at the same time that we're going to talk about today, that mainly the 1600s. And um, um, Rembrandt is, uh, he lives in Amsterdam, okay? Amsterdam is one of these cities that uh, overnight became um, an enormous trade hub and like the capital of merchant trading um, for the world, pretty much. And uh, it was kind of built overnight. Like immediately you have all these really wealthy merchants and Amsterdam is the place where they're settling. It's the place where all their money and goods are being traded. And when that happens, you end up with incredibly wealthy uh, people. And what do wealthy people want? Well, they want the largest house uh, and the uh, most impressive stuff. And uh, when they have large houses, they have lots of walls, and they want artists to paint portraits to put on those walls. And so there's a portrait boom in the city of Amsterdam. And Rembrandt, by far the most sought after and well-respected uh, portrait painter in uh, Amsterdam, okay? Uh, so here you go. This is a self-portrait from Rembrandt. We'll talk more about his self-portraits in a couple minutes. Uh, but uh, you might notice right away that that dark and light is very present. Uh, that's something that would have traveled uh, north as a result of Caravaggio, who was uh, long dead by this point. But also, um, uh, after Caravaggio died, there was you know followers who copied his paintings, called the Caravaggisti. That's what they did. They were painters who, who uh, made copies of paintings and sold them and brought them to other churches and other places. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, versions of different paintings out there that were, you know, copied from other people. And eventually those ideas spread to the north. And this idea of having this almost completely dark picture, but this beam of light, um, you know, this chiaroscuro is the Italian word again for dark and light. And that's, that's the painting technique. It spreads, and uh, so you see it in all kinds of painters working at this time. Uh, the difference with Rembrandt is it's super soft with Rembrandt. To see Caravaggio, it's very stark, very bold, um, incredibly realistic. And with Rembrandt, it's much softer uh, in the darkness. Uh, he, Rembrandt, I think, is significant because he also revolutionizes the way that painting goes onto the canvas. Check out this picture of this merchant. Here's a self-portrait that he would have been paid handsomely to paint, okay, of a wealthy merchant. Uh, most likely for his home. And uh, again, in the dark, it's so dark you can hardly see his hat on the top of his head. He is illuminated like he's standing in a darkened room with a, uh, you know, one ceiling light shining down on him or a spotlight. Um, check out his face, obviously super smooth and highly realistic. Uh, but then look down at his coat, look at the, particularly at the uh, white laciness on the wrists of his gloves there or on those yellow um, sewn tassels on the edge of his uh, red cloak there. Um, now, if Caravaggio were painting this painting, every single one of those little threads would be painted with absolute precision and total realism. Um, if you look, it's almost as if Rembrandt has painted the face, you know, with exquisite detail here, softness and detail. And then uh, if you look at those yellow tassels on the, on the red coat there, almost like he's just tried to paint them as quickly as possible to leave them kind of energetic and rough. That might not seem like a big deal to us today, but to people at this time, that would have been considered a huge deal. Um, that you can le let paint be somewhat energetic and rough or quickly applied as opposed to incredibly slowly and carefully applied. You know, those are things that would have stood out a great deal to people at the time. To some people, that would have been a sign that you can't paint because it's not how you're supposed to do it. When you paint, you're supposed to, you know, smooth things to the extreme and make them look as realistic as possible. And Rembrandt, I think, realizes, um, you know, important, quite importantly, that when you look at a portrait, you're not looking at someone's coat. That's not the important part of the portrait. The important part of the portrait is the face. And you can allow paint to be paint, and you can even um, leave it somewhat energetically applied, and it will still work visually with your eye. That's the difference with Rembrandt. We'll go quick through some of these here, but there are group portraits like this one here. Here's the Cloth Makers Guild, okay? Um, you know, and this is people who would have commissioned a group portrait. This is probably Rembrandt's most famous work right here. It's called The Night Watch. The Night Watch. And, uh, you know, Amsterdam was such a new city that it was still figuring out how to govern itself. They had, um, instead of a police force, a roaming militia. A militia is basically just a bunch of people who own guns, and weapons who wander the streets every night and keep order and keep a peace. 
And um, so this militia, uh, 40 people strong, commissioned Rembrandt to make this enormous group portrait of them, to put all of them in a portrait. The problem with a group portrait is that almost immediately infighting occurs because how do you decide among those 40 uh, who goes in the middle? How do you, how do you decide who's uh, you know, in a prominent space and who's in the background? And so as he starts painting this and they start seeing it, uh, almost immediately there's fighting among them, right? How come he's in the front? How come I'm in the back? How come you can only see a little bit of my face and you don't even see my good side, but you see all of him in the front? He looks mighty and he looks good, but I don't. Anyway, you can imagine the frustration. Um, after over a year of painting it, um, basically they refused. Some, some started pulling their money, refusing to pay him. And so Rembrandt uh, uses emphasis to basically solve a problem here. He says, fine, if you're going to pay me, uh, like you said that you would, I'll put you in a prominent spot. So look at these gentlemen in the front. They're illuminated by the light, right? One gentleman has a yellow coat on, so he just pops out from that whole background. Uh, so you can sense him doing that where he's saying, fine, if you're not going to pay me or if you're not going to, if you only paid me a little bit, but you're, you're pulling the rest of your payments, I'll put you in the back and I'll cover half of your face. So look in the very back there and you can see there's some gentlemen who have an arm in front of their face there, or you only see their eyes and their hat. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty deliberate attempt to, um, you know, try to just deal with really, really difficult clients. He was really upset with the picture and kind of discarded it when it was done uh, because they refused to buy it. Um, and now it's the prized painting at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And one of the great masterpieces from this time. Notice how the whole upper half is pretty much just dark as well, right? It, it's a masterpiece of that chiaroscuro, um, dark and light. Rembrandt um, has some beautiful biblical paintings. You may have seen some of these uh, in other classes. Uh, we'll just go through a few of them here. Here's his uh, return of the prodigal. So the prodigal son from the story of Jesus here goes off and squanders his, his father's wealth and is eventually eating pig's food, comes all the way back and falls at his feet, you know, uh, and his, the father runs out. Um, you know, his, his son was lost, but now is found. So there's this just beautiful emotional moment here where the, the father hugs the son, and you can see his foot, uh, you know, his shoe is so rotten, it's actually fallen off his foot there, his dirty foot towards us, while the older brothers look on, you know, kind of in disgust that their father, you know, is doing this. Um, he, he painted many uh, of these uh, uh, biblical scenes. Um, here's an earlier one, which I like to flash back to just because we looked at Abraham and Isaac last week, and this is an early Rembrandt that is, you know, a little bit uncharacteristic for him, but, you know, talk about high action here. Rembrandt about to uh, slay his son, and the angel steps in, and he even drops the knife, uh, you know, almost as if it's going to fall on him here. Um, lots of crucifixion scenes. Remember, how are you making your money at this time? You're making it for portraits, and you're making it for people who are buying, um, uh, pictures or commissioning pictures from you uh, to be hung in churches. So strange lighting though, right? Look at this. Um, there's dead Christ being taken off the cross here, and it almost looks like a bunch of figures in a parking lot at, at night, and somebody's turned on their, um, their headlights on their car, right? It's a weird lighting directly from the side, which is very strange. And this was popular in Amsterdam at this time, was the idea of, of really strange light sources. Here's another crucifixion, this a raising of the cross. This one cracks me up because if you look, obviously the whole you know, point of the piece is the most important sacrifice ever here from Christ on the cross. But who's in the middle is actually these two guys, uh, one of them standing with a big turban holding the edge of his sword looking out at us. I mean, it should come as no surprise, that's the guy who commissioned the painting, right? Uh, who's, who's paying uh, Rembrandt a healthy sum in order to uh, you know, paint this crucifixion which will hang in the church and also conveniently have a picture of him for, uh, for all of time uh, so that everybody knows the wealthy guy who donated the painting. Rembrandt, very wealthy uh, and extremely successful during his lifetime. Uh, he really, you know, he was the most in-demand um, painter of his day. He um, drew a lot as well. We have tons of Rembrandt's notebooks, and there's a lot of really clever drawings in there. He made self-portraits his whole life, so you can actually see how he aged and how he views himself every single year. So here he is as a younger man making a goofy face from a drawing in one of his books. He did elaborate um, etchings as well. So these are prints um, that would have been circulated into books, just beautifully uh, made and uh, just extremely delicate and soft in their dark and light. So here's Christ teaching his followers. You can see that slightest bit of a halo around his face 
Also, just look at the dark and light in this picture, and it almost looks like a yin-yang if you see that. Uh, the light shape of all the people in the foreground balances out this dark shape in the background. Like I said, strange light sources. Um, this is a just a perfect example of that. Such a strange picture. Look at it carefully. See if you can tell what scene it is. Um, we have a woman darting out of a tent here in the back. She's holding in her hands a big pair of scissors in one hand and a big chunk of hair in the other. Uh, and so this is Samson and Delilah, right? So Samson um, reveals to Delilah that his hair is the source of his strength, and so she cuts off his hair, and the soldiers come into his tent and gouge his eyes out. So yikes, look at this guy lunging across Samson here, plunging a knife into his eyeball. Yummy. Um, anyway, the strange thing is the light source, right? Where are we as the viewer? We're wedged in the back of the tent, um, almost like you know we're, we're witnessing this violent melee here. Um, and this uh, guard to the left of the picture there, uh, holding his uh, spear out, um, is silhouetted against the light of the back. The whole idea is putting a, a, a light source with a contained light source in the picture. Very strange, very odd arrangement, and you know, kind of a, the new thing to do in painting at this time. This painting is owned by the Minneapolis uh, Institute of Arts. It's probably their most valuable painting, so you should go check it out. It's called the Lucretia. Uh, Rembrandt has an amazing way of painting eyes. Uh, oftentimes, they feel like they're following you in a museum extremely emotional uh, faces that he'll, he's able to paint as well. So here's the story about Rembrandt. Like I said, he was super wealthy and uh, you know, uh, could kind of uh, have any commission he wanted and, and was um, extremely successful from a young age in Amsterdam. Uh, but his story turned pretty sad uh, and it affected his art as well. So here he is as a young, brash, confident man putting himself in a pose here that's a direct copy from a Renaissance painting by the artist Titian, who we didn't get to talk about, but you know he's confidently leaning on his elbow, looking at us in this large, luxurious robe. You know uh, he's on top of the world as a young man. Uh, but um, things changed uh, for Rembrandt. So here he is as a younger man, and here he is in his 60s. Um, so the story of Rembrandt is this: uh, first of all, um, he had a really bad year. In one year, uh, tuberculosis, okay, illness came through. Amsterdam and claimed the lives of his wife and three of his four young children. So he was left a widower with one uh, young son. Uh, so he lost his family. Also, around the same time, his commissions dried up. He'd been the popular artist for um, a decade or two, and then all of a sudden, um, new artists were coming onto the scene, and people weren't interested in what Rembrandt could do anymore. They wanted the new artist. They wanted the new hot thing. And so, uh, you know, all of a sudden he didn't have a steady income. The problem is that Rembrandt, um, not unlike um, your professional athlete today who decides to, you know, once they start making millions of dollars as a professional athlete, buy their own private jet and 10 houses and cars and, um, and then all of that same stuff for all of their friends, uh, and then only to go broke, right, as soon as they stop playing. It, it's really common in sports. Uh, among uh, highly paid um, athletes that they go broke. Not unlike that, he, he had a ton of uh, money that he borrowed on credit because he was a furious collector. He had a huge house in Amsterdam, which today is the Rembrandt Museum, and it was full of stuff. And uh, he traveled all over Europe and, and North Africa and just bought everything and had it all shipped back. And he had to sit back and watch while uh, repo men came and repossessed all of the stuff that he had in his house, and so he lost his huge house and lost his family, and he was a devastated uh, person, and he was kind of passed over as a has-been and somebody who at one time was great, but now is not great anymore. So here he is at a self-portrait late in his 60s wearing this ridiculous robe. This is not how people would have dressed at the time. Um, he knows it's over the top and kind of a pompous here to have this giant gold robe with a red sash, and he's holding a scepter. It's, it's almost like he's painted himself as an old, out-of-touch king, right, who's looking at us with these sad eyes as if to say, I'm still here, I still have my dignity. The sad story of Rembrandt is that he, he died most likely believing that, you know, he didn't really have a legacy, that he'd been completely passed over. Uh, and, um, of course, the opposite was true. Uh, you know, he, he uh, in the years after his death, was declared, you know, the most significant painter of his day, and uh, today remains... Uh, one of the most um, 
you know, impressive and talented painters that uh, has ever uh, walked the earth, for sure. Uh, and he, again, using that dark and light, managed to, to emotionally convey things through portraits and pictures of people that hadn't been done before, but also softness, the way that he painted just a beautifully delicate kind of way, and the way that he left unfinished or quickly painted areas as well. It's kind of a revolution in the way that you can apply paint uh, to a canvas. All right, our next artist is uh, Velasquez. Diego Velasquez is his name. Diego Velasquez is a Spanish artist living the same uh, time frame basically as Rembrandt, who we just talked about, uh, except he's in uh, sunny Spain rather than in uh, 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 Amsterdam. And Spain is a deeply, deeply Catholic country. Uh, there's no Protestant Reformation going on in Spain. Uh, and all of this doubling down on uh, the extravagance of art that we've seen with Caravaggio is, uh, is happening in Spain as well. With Velazquez, though, there's a little bit of a different slant on it. And he um, makes his art about other things rather than just um, uh, church subjects and commissioned pictures. For example, this picture right here. This is called the water carrier, the water carrier. Uh, and so here, you know, we've got a dirt poor peasant uh, wearing a tattered old piece of cloth for a cloak here. Look at the shoulders actually all ripped there. And what's his job? Every day he goes down to the well uh, and he, uh, you know, fills up this uh, uh, big jug and he hauls it around and he gives people uh, something to drink. You can see a gentleman there in the background looking out at us in the darkness there who's got uh, glass up to his lips to uh, take a drink as well. Um, but incredibly realistic and just beautifully painted. Look at the, the realism to that jug or to the smaller jug on the table there. Um, and uh, these are not the kind of people who are going to pay you to paint a picture, right? They're dirt poor peasants. This is still a time when people who are nobles, um, people um, who are part of the royal family, they have all the money, and then most of the people are dirt poor peasants. And for the first time here, uh, we're seeing a, a picture of the other side, right? We're seeing a picture of uh, the people who can't afford to have their pictures painted or, or paid uh, to have uh, biblical scenes commissioned for churches uh, to flaunt their wealth. Uh, we're actually seeing Velasquez doing this on his own time and on his own dime as well. Uh, and that's a completely different um, kind of subject as well. Incredibly talented painter, one of the most talented painters who ever lived, but also, you know, a socially conscious painter, I think you could say, in a lot of ways. Here he is, self-portrait uh, from Velasquez. We really don't know much about his life at all. A lot of the records have been lost, uh, being that it was 400 years ago now. Um, but there he is. We, uh, some things are known. Uh, he was obviously uh, uh, trained as, you know, to, to be a painter and was an extremely talented painter from a younger age. Check out this super stark crucifixion background, just absolutely jet black. His body almost as if it's glowing here. Um, made trips back and forth to Italy and to other places as well. And so he would have also seen and been aware of Caravaggio's work and the work of the Caravaggisti who were copying and circulating his works, uh, turned on to that whole idea of Baroque painting, which pioneered by Bernini, or by Caravaggio, and, and also in sculpture by Bernini. Uh, we know he went to Rome, um, and uh, he was a portrait painter as well. So here's one of his most famous uh, portraits here. This is called the portrait of Pope Innocent X. Uh, popes choose their new name, right? So this guy named himself Pope Innocent. There you go. But almost how you know you can see this kind of satin um, vestment that he's wearing there. It, it feels very real. And uh, again, um, just a powerful portrait. The guy could paint faces, um, you know, just with absolute precision. Um, brought that back to Spain and eventually became uh, the court painter for the King of Spain. So what he does is he lives at the palace in Madrid, and his job is just to paint whatever the king tells him to paint. So. Check out this guy right here. This is actually the king of Spain. This is King um, uh, uh, Philip here, okay, Philip IV. And uh, Philip IV, um, in this picture, you might notice how he just looks super stretched out and tall, like really long arm. His body's impossibly long and tall. These are big paintings, uh, quite uh, tall and, and 
quite large. They would have been hung uh, off the ground by quite a ways too, so that when you look at them from down below, uh, you're actually, you know, the, the body looks a little shorter. So they've intentionally kind of stressed, uh, stretched out. Um, anyway, uh, Velasquez is there at the palace. His job is to uh, uh, paint uh, the king. And um, so here's Philip. You might notice uh, Philip has a kind of a strange looking jaw. He's part of the Habsburg dynasty. Uh, we can possibly go into all the details because it's way too confusing and, and mostly irrelevant, but kind of a fun detail. The Habsburgs, um, all the royal families of Europe, different countries were interrelated. In other words, the best way to broker a peace deal or to uh, you know, offer an olive branch to uh, a neighboring country uh, to seal treaties, that sort of thing, is to marry off your daughter or your son you know, to, uh, in arranged marriages to other royal families. Well, by the time Philip's come around, there's been quite a bit of inbreeding then because, of course, you can only marry people of royal blood. So you have first cousins marrying first cousins, that sort of thing. And as a result, one is a, uh, a big uh, giant underbite, okay, of a jaw and these huge lips. Uh, that's a, a common genetic deformity that comes from close inbreeding. So kind of an interesting tangent that you can go back and you can look at um, uh, portraits of wealthy rulers and kind of see who was part of the Habsburg family. It's known today as the Habsburg jaw, um, you know, by the way that their face looks. So here's Philip uh, writing a letter here uh, in this stark portrait. Here he is in his super fancy over-the-top uh, regal wear with his sword and gloves and a big handlebar mustache. Here he is in his hunting garb. Uh, looking out at us with his musket and his hunting dog. You get the idea. That's his job. He paints whatever the, the king wants him to paint. And that includes, you know, visitors who come from other places or um, basically whatever the king wants. It's a pretty secure job, though. He can kind of be uh, fed and housed and uh, um, make art without having to worry about um, making a living because he's being taken care of. Probably his most famous painting and his masterwork is this one right here. Las Meninas is the name of the picture. And uh, this is a stunning reversal of what a picture should be. So study it carefully. Try to figure out what in the world is going on. It's super strange. If you think about the other paintings we've seen, there's always one person looking out at us who's being painted. But now we're actually seeing a group of figures just kind of standing around. So this is actually a reverse portrait. So Velasquez, for the first time, is doing something really creative that other artists have not thought to do. Instead of painting uh, the person who is sitting for their portrait, he's actually painting what the people who are having their pictures painted would see. On the left side of the picture here, there's a large canvas against uh, the uh, ground there on an easel. You can see uh, the back of the wood frame there. That's Velasquez standing next to it. It looks like he's dressed like a knight with a red cross on his... Uh, uh, chest there. He's holding a paint palette in his hands with his paintbrush and he's looking at us. He's studying us. Right behind him and kind of the center of the picture there, the back of the room, you can see a fuzzy mirror in the back. So you can actually, if you look really, really close, you can see Philip uh, IV and his queen there in the mirror. So in other words, uh, you know, we, he's putting us in the shoes of the king. And then in front of us along the floor here, uh, we have um, the royal children, okay? And so they're playing, and it's just like any uh, family. You know, you got little kids around. They're going to be squirrely. They're going to run around. Uh, they're going to be playing. And you can imagine every day uh, Philip uh, coming down to have his portrait painted for a couple hours, sitting still while the kids run around on the floor. And then, you know, this is it's what we do. So there's the princess there, dead center of the picture at the bottom there. There's the family dog uh, laying on the ground. You can see the family dwarf. Yes, I said family dwarf off there to the right. If you were lucky enough to be born with dwarfism at this time, uh, you could actually um, find work as a royal caretaker for uh, the royal children. Um, don't ask me why. It's just true. Uh, so that's who's off to the right there. And then mysterious kind of figure in the doorway and behind. You can just assume that's like an advisor of some kind to the king here. Um, anyway... Um, this is a, uh, it's a, uh, a strange um, reverse portrait where he's actually placing the viewer in the shoes of the king and seeing what the king would see. Uh, that's significant. Um, that's not something to be glossed over. Um, 
you know, the king is important, and that's why we see pictures of the king, right? We don't often see, uh, we get to, uh, you know, have the artist showing us what the king would see. So it's a, uh, a huge uh, creative advancement for painting to, to think outside the box about what else you could show with art. Um, beyond that, pictures of peasants. And there's just a few more of these, and then we're done. Uh, we talked last time about Caravaggio's Bacchus. If you remember, Bacchus is the Roman god of wine and partying. So he's often seen shirtless or wearing a toga uh, with a cornucopia hat full of fruits and vegetables. And uh, if you remember, Caravaggio's Bacchus uh, had a bowl of fruit that was starting to rot. Uh, this Bacchus shows up, and look how he's just incredibly bright, almost like he's shining, or there's a direct spotlight right on him here. Uh, he's shown up with his wine, uh, you know, to uh, have a party here. But notice how he hasn't shown up to the, the uh, wealthy people in the city. He's actually shown up to a bunch of dirt poor um, Spanish farmers here. So you can see them off to the side there laughing, uh, holding his big cup of wine. And, you know, they're super excited. Bacchus, of all people, has chosen, uh, you know, to party with them. They, they don't deserve it. They're the lonely peasants, right? Uh, this one a gentleman leans down, and, and Bacchus puts a laurel or a leaf crown around his head as well. So... You know, it's just, you can sense underneath it here that Velasquez is telling us, you know, there, there are other people as well, besides just the wealthy people uh, who we see in art and who have, who have the power, right? Um, commoners are people as well. Again, not, not a lot's known about Velasquez, and, and so you have to kind of read into the larger message of his pictures, but I think he, certainly being that he's around the king and the queen all the time at the palace and painting whatever is there and, and living with all these riches and wealth and food and everything else. It, it, it must have been difficult for him to know uh, how everybody else was living outside of the palace, and perhaps that's why he turned his attention to making these pictures. Uh, they were not seen as, you know, indecent. In fact, they became these curiosities uh, and quite collectible among wealthy people who thought, you know, that's the most absurd thing ever. I've never seen a, a painting of a dirt poor uh, filthy peasants. Uh, I think I have to have that, right? It, it instead became uh, highly sought after, which is, is kind of a, ironic, I guess. Uh, here's the egg boiler. You might notice this uh, uh, little boy here off to the side who's uh, holding a jug. He's actually the same boy who shows up, okay, or the same model for Velasquez as the water carrier. There he is again. So it's the same kid. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this peasant woman leans over and boils some eggs um, in water here. Uh, for her meal, but just, you know, incredibly realistic, uh, just beautifully, beautifully painted, um, and just showcasing how ridiculously talented Velasquez is. So, if there's something to be taken from uh, Velasquez, it's the idea that art can have a conscience, uh, that it can uh, cause you to uh, empathize or, or think about other people, um, perhaps people who find themselves in difficult places too. For the first time, we're seeing art with a conscience, and we'll see that next week. We're going to talk about two artists who confronted direct um, social issues uh, with their art. Uh, so there you go. Rembrandt, self-portrait, Velasquez, the water carrier. Thanks for paying attention, and uh, we'll see you next time.